So I always start dry needling courses with the Wikipedia definition of dry needling because what's going to happen when you start talking to a patient about dry needling, they're going to take out their phone and they're going to Google dry needling and one of the first things that they're going to see is the Wikipedia definition. So Wikipedia says dry needling, also known as myofascial trigger point dry needling, is the use of either solid filiform needles, also referred to as acupuncture needles, or hollow core hypodermic needles for therapy of muscle pain, including pain related to myofascial pain syndrome. The American Physical Therapy Association, Description of Dry Needling in Clinical Practice, the APTA states dry needling is a skilled intervention that uses a thin filiform needle to penetrate the skin and stimulate underlying myofascial trigger points, muscular and connective tissues for the management of neuromusculoskeletal pain and movement impairments. A little bit about the dry needling history. This all started with injections into myofascial trigger points and, and these trigger points were hyper irritable spots in muscles. It was first proposed by the medical doctors, uh, Janet Travell and David Simons. Everybody's heard of Travell and Simons and their pain referral patterns. That was a long time ago. That was back in the early 1940s. These physicians performed uh, clinical trials and they injected various substances in, into uh, the dysfunctional part of the muscle, the painful part of the muscle. Some of those substances included corticosteroids, analgesics, saline, uh, just all kind of stuff into these muscles, into these trigger points, these areas in the muscle. So as you know, with a randomized clinical trial, you've got to have a control. So that's the placebo. So the placebo in their clinical trials was inserting a needle without injecting a substance. Uh, and surprisingly, this offered very similar results. The wider use of dry needling started after a study in the late 70s by a Czech physician, Dr. Carl Lewitt, where he determined that the needling effect is distinct from that of the injective substance. And, and then you got this term dry versus wet needling. We'll talk about that in, the, in great detail a little bit later. Since then, numerous medical studies have found minimal difference between injections of different substances and dry needling in the treatment of musculoskeletal pain. The causative factor seems to be the mechanical stimulation by the needle itself in the area of dysfunction versus actually injecting something into the area. Again, that's where you get the dry versus the wet needling. So is it acupuncture? This is the question <laughs> that you will literally get asked every day that you go to needle a new patient. You start talking to the new patient about having dry needling done. They'll look at you and be like, oh, like acupuncture? Uh, you start talking to a provider that you're going to start offering dry needling. The provider will look at you like, oh, like acupuncture? Like it doesn't matter if that's a physician or an NP or a PA. Pretty much everybody just assumes when you're sticking a needle in the tissue and there's no injection, they just assume that it's acupuncture. So let's, let's talk about acupuncture, let's talk about the similarities, and let's talk about the differences as well. So acupuncture is a form of traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, it's been practiced forever, for centuries. It's based on the theory that energy, called qi, and that could also be spelled with a qi, same thing, qi, flows through and around your body along these pathways called meridians. Acupuncturists believe that illness occurs when something blocks or it unbalances your qi. And then acupuncture is a way to unblock or influence qi and help it flow back into balance. Qi uh, energy, qi energy flows through a meridian or an energy highway, assessing all parts of the body. These meridians can be mapped throughout the body. They flow within the body. They're not on the surface. Meridians and meridians exist in corresponding pairs. And then each meridian has many acupuncture points along its path. So how do acupuncturists diagnose? Uh, kind of the most important things is a tongue and a pulse diagnosis. Uh, those are the two most important diagnostic tools in, in Chinese medicine. They're both used to revive, uh, derive a traditional Chinese medicine diagnosis for your condition, which is used to plan your treatment. Generally, I'm quoting from an article here, but generally the tongue is easier to learn and it's less objective than pulse diagnosis. It's less meridian specific than the pulse. However, the tongue will show the depth and nature of an imbalance and it's less affected by short term influences. So when we look at a, a tongue map here, like literally you go to an acupuncturist and you, you're going to stick out your tongue and they're going to traditional Chinese medicine acupuncture and they're ac traditional Chinese medicine acupuncturist. You're going to stick out your tongue and they're going to feel your pulse. And when they look at your tongue, they're going to look for, I guess, dysfunctional areas of your tongue. And let's just say that the, the left side of your tongue is looking a little sketchy uh, right there where it says liver and gallbladder. So then these acupuncturists are going to go to... Uh, acupoints on the body that correspond to the liver and the gallbladder and they may stick some needles in those acupoints that may be in your foot that may be in your knee that may be in your hand it may be in your butt wherever and it's going to uh, restore the a proper energy flow uh, to your liver and your gallbladder and then your tongue's going to look better so you know that's that's not anything that that we know about in, in the western medical literature there's certainly not anything that we know about as, as physical therapists as, as an evidence-based way to choose where to stick our needles but this is an example of a tongue layout and a tongue map that uh, traditional uh, Chinese medicine acupuncturists use to try to figure out where they're going to stick their needles. 
So this is an article. Uh, it's from an acupuncture journal. So it's a little bit skewed towards acupuncture, but they bring up some, some really interesting points. So I want to quote some of the stuff from this article. So this was published in Acupuncture Medicine back in 2015. So traditional acupuncture, which they abbreviate as TA, Western Medical Acupuncture is abbreviated as WMA, and dry needling, which they're abbreviating as DN, are all needling procedures that involve penetration of the skin with solid filiform needles with some type of therapeutic intent. Dry needling is a technique that physical therapists and other healthcare professionals use to treat a variety of painful conditions of the musculoskeletal system, usually myofascial pain syndrome, where traditional acupuncture is a technique used by professional acupuncturists. Compared with dry needling, both traditional acupuncture and western medical acupuncture have a broader range of indications, including musculoskeletal pain and gastrointestinal and neurological disorders. Dry needling and acupuncture clearly overlap to some extent in view of their most common indication, which is musculoskeletal pain, and their use of solid filiform needles. According to these authors, acupuncture training requires hundreds to thousands of hours of acupuncture education. And then again, I'm quoting from this article, dry needling training for PTs is done only through continued education or certificate programs, which these authors claim aren't strictly regulated and have few, if any, standards that need to be complied with. You know, just to quickly disagree with them, like Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, Illinois, Florida, we have some very strict practice acts uh, and we have some very strict requirements compared to other states about uh, physical therapy performing dry needling. However, some states don't have any opinion about dry needling. Uh, like our neighbor in Alabama, uh, they let the individual therapists interpret their practice act and determine whether they think dry needling is within their scope of practice or not. Uh, and then in Tennessee, there's a little bit of regulation for chiropractors, but look at how much it is. Chiropractors in Tennessee only need 10 hours before they can start sticking needles in their patients. Uh, that just that just blows my mind. I, you know, I teach a 54-hour course series. I can't even imagine how I could condense anything down to just a little quick 10-hour thing. Uh, kind of kind of blows my mind. But some states have a lot of regulation. And some states do not have much regulation. Still quoting from this article, dry needling originally involved hypodermic needles into trigger points by Travell and Simons a long time ago. They, they're saying back in 1952. And then the line started to blur in the study about Lewitt, uh, which is the Czech physician, Dr. Lewitt, in 1979 because he used acupuncture needles instead of hypodermics. And then Gunn uh, and colleagues in 1980 recommended manipulation of the acupuncture needle in a trigger point to produce a grabbing sensation. And then Gunn even admitted that his technique was inspired by some traditional acupuncture techniques. So yeah, the line started to blur because uh, Dr. Lou was like, okay, we don't need to inject anything. So what can I use that's not as invasive as a hypodermic? Because I don't need a hypodermic. I'm not going to inject anything. And he was like, oh, well, how about I use an acupuncture needle? That'll work. And so he started using acupuncture needles. And then Dr. Gunn, same kind of thing, acupuncture needles. And he was like, hmm, maybe we can manipulate these needles a little bit. So he started manipulating those needles. And he even, he even admitted that it was inspired by some traditional acupuncture techniques, even though he wasn't an acupuncturist, but it was still inspired by some of their techniques. Theories of dry needling are based on an understanding of human anatomy and physiology regarding myofascial pain and trigger points. And then acupuncture treatment and point selection is based on syndrome differentiation, which incorporates tongue inspection, pulse palpation, and systematic inquiry. This is a process that many acupuncturists and traditional Chinese medicine practitioners use to generate a traditional diagnosis, treatment principle, and treatment plan. Again, quoting from this acupuncture article, acupuncture overlaps with dry needling with respect to needling instruments, technique, and its widespread use in the disorders of the musculoskeletal system. And according to these authors, acupuncture points and trigger points overlap significantly in the treatment of pain. And then a localized twitch response in dry needling and the disease sensation in acupuncture are both used as prognostic criteria to predict the effectiveness of needling. So just like the previous slide said, do correlations exist between acupuncture and trigger points? So in 1977, Dr. Melzak postulated 71% of acupoints and myofascial trigger points correlated, and they were often the same thing. Dr. Melzak's results in this correlation argument are frequently used as ammunition against non-acupuncturists performing dry needling. Over the years, I've seen multiple, multiple times of uh, acupuncturists making this argument that 71% of acupoints and trigger points correlated. They were often the same thing. So if you're a physical therapist or an, a non-acupuncture healthcare provider, and you're sticking these little spots in the muscle, well, you're sticking an acupoint because they overlap. Melzak said 71% of them overlap. So you've got a, almost three quarters of a chance, almost 75% chance that you're going to hit an acupoint. However, in 2003, Burt revisited that study and found that 71% correlation is conceptually not possible. Only 40% of the acupoints could even correlate for the treatment of pain, and only 18 to 19% correlated with trigger points. However, you never see that argument. You never see anybody bring up the study by Birch because acupuncture is usually just using the argument by Melzak. 
Uh, but there was a little bit of a rebuttal by Burtz that said that the whole 71% thing is conceptually not even possible. Is there a correlation between acupoints and trigger points? Well, let's be honest. <laughs> How could there not be? Uh, they're just freaking everywhere. So remember, each acupoint has a corresponding pair on the other side of the body. So every little dot you see on this little acupoint chart, all those little black dots you see, guess what? There's one that matches it on the other side of the body. So just outside looking in, I can kind of see how the acupuncturists get all freaked out about non-acupuncture clinicians sticking needles in the body. Because let's just say I'm sticking a needle in the lumbar pair of vertebrals, which are just kind of right in the middle of, uh, of this model here. Uh, you know, I don't know what acupoint's there, but the acupuncturists believe that there's an acupoint there, there that's going to affect something. And when I'm sticking the lumbar pair of vertebrals, they think I'm going to affect something that I shouldn't uh, because I don't know anything about it. And just outside looking in, I can kind of understand their argument. But you know, here's my thing. Any association between a trigger point and an acupoint or meridian is just a chance association because non-acupuncturists don't learn acupoint locations. You're not gonna learn acupoint locations in this course. You shouldn't learn acupoint locations in any of the dry needling courses. The real question is, what do you believe? Acupuncturists believe they're affecting function by restoring energy flow at these points. And then non-acupuncturists, so whoever, physical therapist, occupational therapist, athletic trainer, physician, you know, MD, DO, chiropractor, uh, mid-level providers, NPs, PAs, they believe they're affecting function by directly treating muscle dysfunction and modulating pain in these things called trigger points or painful spots within the muscle. The American Physical Therapy Association, regardless of what you think about the APTA, I can promise you that you as a physical therapist would never have been able to perform dry needling if not for the efforts of the American Physical Therapy Association. In 2012, they created a position paper, which is just a humongous white paper, uh, basically. Uh, I'm quoting from a couple of things from that paper. Acupuncturists may not call any of their interventions physical therapy. Physical therapists may not use the term acupuncture for their interventions. Healthcare education and practice have developed in such a way that most professions today share some procedures, tools, or interventions with other regulated professions. It is unreasonable to expect a profession to have exclusive domain over an intervention, a tool, or a modality. However, we know that, that professions do try to uh, have exclusive domain over an intervention. Uh, it's just like you know the long-time battle in some states between physical therapists performing manipulations and chiropractors not wanting physical therapists to perform manipulations. Sometimes that battle goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Sometimes the physical therapists win, sometimes the chiropractors win. Uh, so, you know, it, it, even though the APTA says it's unreasonable to expect a profession to have exclusive domain, we know that some professions do try to have exclusive domain. More from the APTA position paper, the practice of acupuncture by acupuncturists and the performance of dry needling by physical therapists differ in terms of historical, philosophical, indicative, and practical context. The performance of modern dry needling by physical therapists is based on Western neuroanatomy and modern scientific study of the musculoskeletal and the nervous system. Physical therapists who perform dry needling do not use traditional acupuncture theories or acupuncture terminology. You know, it's a constant battle though, uh, dry needling versus acupuncturists. Uh, acupuncturists have powerful advocacy. At the time of this recording, uh, California, Utah, New York, and Hawaii, dry needling is, is simply not allowed. In the California and the Hawaii Practice Act, long before anybody ever thought about doing dry needling, they put something in the Practice Act that prevents a physical therapist from puncturing the skin with any type of therapeutic intent. And again, that was put in long before uh, long before dry needling even came around. I'm assuming that was to you know, kind of prevent therapists from ever doing injections like joint injections or trigger point injections. Uh, but now, because that's in their practice act, and unless they do an amendment, they're not going to be able to do any type of dry needling because they can't puncture the skin. So what happened in Tennessee? It's a very interesting story about what happened in Tennessee. The Tennessee Physical Therapy Association, the State Board of, of Physical Therapy in Tennessee, wanted to perform dry needling. So they went to the Attorney General, who is the top lawyer of the land, and they took their practice act to the Attorney General. Said, hey, Mr. Attorney General, will you look at our practice act and let us know if you think dry needling is within the scope of practice of physical therapists? So the Attorney General did his thing. He looked in the Practice Act and he was like, yeah, dry needling is within the scope of practice of physical therapy. So AG opinion was that, boom, dry needling was within the scope of practice of physical therapists. So all these physical therapists in Tennessee started getting certified, started creating business models around dry needling, started, you know, paid all kind of money to get certified and start doing it, all that fun stuff. Then a new Attorney General comes to town, whether that was appointed or elected, I'm, I'm not real sure. But the Acupuncture Board took the Practice Act of the physical therapist to the new Attorney General and they said, hey, Mr. Attorney General, physical therapists are doing dry needling. They say it's within their practice act, but we don't even see anything in here about dry needling within this practice act. So we don't think they should be able to do it. Will you look at their practice act and tell us what you think? 
So this new attorney general looked at the Physical Therapy Practice Act and he was like, hmm, there's nothing in here about dry needling. Therefore, my opinion is that dry needling is not within the scope of practice of physical therapists. So, uh-oh, <laughs> the new AG opinion came out and all the physical therapists had to stop performing dry needling uh, until they could do an amendment of the Practice Act. So that's what they did. The Tennessee uh, physical therapist amended their practice act. However, that took forever. It has to go through the House. It has to go through the Senate. It has to go through all these subcommittees. It has to be voted on in the House Senate. It has to go to the governor. It has to be signed into law. That just takes a couple of years. And sure enough, it took them a couple of years to amend their practice act. Once your practice act is amended to include dry needling, it's a law. It's not like the acupuncturist can change it at that point. So practice act changes have helped. Several states have amended their practice acts. Uh, however, non-acupuncturists, uh, so like I mentioned earlier, PTs, OTs, trainers, physicians, chiropractors, we're still a constant target by acupuncturists. Acupuncturists have opposed the use of dry needling by PTs. They state that PTs are practicing acupuncture. We're not qualified to do so, and we're a risk to the public safety. So it's, it's a constant battle. This is just a brief video put together by an acupuncturist verbalizing all the harm that dry needling is causing at the hands of, quote, unqualified practitioners. Uh, therapists and non-acupuncturists. Non I just want you to know kind of what they are saying about you. You could find this video on YouTube, but we're going to watch it right now during this lecture. Dry needling is quickly becoming a buzzword within the sports medicine field. It offers quick recovery times for muscle strains and sprains, improves joint range of motion, and can even improve sports performance. With its growing popularity, there is some concern over who is qualified to perform this procedure. According to the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, dry needling is an invasive procedure and adverse effects may include bruising, collapsed lungs, nerve injury, vascular injury, or infection. The instrument used in dry needling can exceed four inches in length. They are sterile, solid, filiform needles that are regulated by the FDA as acupuncture needles. Many chiropractors and physical therapists object to this labeling, claiming that one profession cannot have exclusive rights to a tool or instrument. They use the argument, just because you use a calculator, that doesn't mean you're an accountant. True, but due to the inherent risk of puncturing the skin several inches and the possible adverse events, the FDA has determined that, quote, sale must be clearly restricted to qualified practitioners of acupuncture as determined by the states, unquote. Physical therapists and chiropractors maintain that their education in anatomy and physiology and clinical experience working on the surface of the skin is enough to qualify them for this procedure of puncturing the skin. So let's take a look. Acupuncturists are required to have a minimum of over 700 classroom hours and 660 supervised clinical hours in the training of acupuncture. That does not include all the additional required education and testing in anatomy and physiology, biochemistry, and clinical science classes. Most dry needling courses for chiropractors and physical therapists are held over a weekend, some as little as 10 hours long. Does all that extra training make a difference? On June 21, 2006, former judo Olympian Kim Ribble Orr suffered a collapsed lung from a non-acupuncturist doing dry needling, and she says, it just ruined my life. In December 2013, Torin Yader Wallace suffered a collapsed lung from a physical therapist performing dry needling in Colorado while he was preparing to compete in the Sochi Olympics. Mitch Clark is a professional mixed martial arts fighter that had to have an acupuncture needle surgically removed from his arm and miss a fight after a needle broke when a non-acupuncturist was performing his needling. It is because of these and countless other stories that the American Medical Association and American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation have both come out with statements stating, quote, dry needling should only be performed by practitioners with standard training and familiarity with routine use of needles in their practice, such as licensed medical physicians and licensed acupuncturists, unquote. It is true that there are many physical therapists and chiropractors that have performed dry needling without incident, but when it comes to your health, is it really worth the risk? 
So there are some significant claims being made in this video. Uh, you know, with the exception of it kind of being a crappy made video, it's like a, a just an actor standing in front of a green screen, and the green screen is a picture of like a science lab. Like nothing about that makes sense. But everything in the video is the arguments that people use to the uh, to the uh, legislators when when they're trying to make decisions about whether non acupuncture should be able to perform dry needling. So I want to talk about some of these significant claims. So the sale of acupuncture needles must be clearly restricted to qualified practitioners of acupuncture. Some have claimed it's a violation of federal law for anyone other than physicians or acupuncturists to purchase needles. Then you saw that chart about the education differences where you had acupuncture way up here, you had physicians here, and then you had physical therapists way down here. They put us below the chiropractors, which kind of hurt my feelings. Uh, but, you know, that's the education differences they're claiming. You saw Kim Little Orr's collapse lung in that, like, gnarly scar. That was a huge scar on her back. Uh, not a typical, uh, you know, chest tube scar. And then Olympic skier Tornado Wallace's collapsed lung. And then you, they talked about Mitch Clark's broken needle. And then the AMA statement regarding dry needle. And I want to talk about all these things and kind of put some of this into perspective. So, purchasing needles. The National Center for Acupuncture Safety and Integrity sent certified letters to the American Physical Therapy Association and various state boards, and they alleged it was illegal for physical therapists to purchase acupuncture needles, and it violated this federal law and this U.S. Uh, FDA implementing regulation. So the APTA hired an independent legal analyst team, and uh, they discovered that the conclusion of that letter from that National Center for Acupuncture Safety and Integrity was completely without merit. Needles were downgraded from a class 3 to a class 2 medical device. And what they determined, the actual law said, was acupuncture needles are for use by qualified practitioners as determined by the states and any other practitioner licensed by the law of the state in which he practices to use or order the device. Uh, to use or order the use of the device. So basically, if you have a license, you can order acupuncture needles. It's kind of interesting that this... Uh, NCASI, they sent this letter. It was basically just a bully tactic, which is which is super sketchy in and of itself. But uh, you think about what could have happened, though, if, if the APTA didn't analyze this. Some state boards could have just went, oh, crap, we're breaking the law. We're, we're literally breaking the law if we allow our therapists to buy acupuncture needles. And they could have sent out letters to the therapists and been like, hey, look, guys, you are breaking the law. You can't buy these acupuncture needles. we got to figure this out. Uh, but fortunately, the APTA, because they're a national advocacy body, they again hired this illegal analyst team, and they discovered that that letter was completely bogus. I mean, just how sketchy is that? Super sketchy. When you talk about the education differences, <laughs> it's, it's funny. We're just looking at apples versus oranges here. Uh, so, in a Colorado lawsuit against physical therapists performing dry needling, which the PTs won, by the way, acupuncturists claimed that there were 1,905 hours of classes to be licensed in acupuncturists versus only 46 hours of training to do dry needling. Uh, the funny thing about lawsuits is, is that when you allege something like that in a lawsuit, then lawyers involved in the lawsuit are going to do discovery and they're going to do research and they're going to they're going to figure uh, all the details out. Well, that's exactly what they did. So the lawyers looked at what this 1,905 hours meant. Guess what it meant? 1,905 hours for acupuncturists included all realms of Chinese medicine along with business and board prep classes. Out of those 1,905 hours, acupuncturists spend 165 to 225 hours on specifically needling and supervised needling technique. The Colorado School of Traditional Chinese Medicine spends 165 hours on needling, but 40 hours of that is on non-needling techniques such as cupping, moxibustion, and gua sha. Uh, this Colorado Center, or Colorado School of Traditional Chinese Medicine, only has eight hours in training their students to needle musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, so, when you compare the 165 hours of actual needle training in acupuncture schools to the 54 hours of dry needling training that you're getting in this course series, the difference is not as dramatic as they would want you to believe. But I, I almost get worked up about this. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're claiming 1,905 hours, but think about what you are as a doctor of physical therapy. You literally went to school for seven years. You have a doctorate. You are an expert in neuromusculoskeletal anatomy. You, as a physical therapist, know more about musculoskeletal anatomy than probably 90% of physicians. I promise you, you know more about it than a family medicine physician, than uh, you know, your OBGYN, than uh, anesthesiologist. Yeah. You know, you, you probably shouldn't know more about it than an orthopedic surgeon, hopefully, because they're the ones cutting on you. And maybe a physical medicine or rehab doc, because they're basically the physician version of a therapist. But I promise you, you are the expert. You know more about it. So it is, it is just insane that... <laughs> These people think that you can't take an expert in musculoskeletal anatomy 
and then teach them how to stick a needle in this, some, in this muscle that they're already an expert in. So it's, it's just a joke. This collapsed lung by Kim Riddle Orr. I have heard about Kim Riddle Orr's lung multiple times over the years. This unfortunate incident has been used as ammunition against physical therapists or just therapists performing dry needling in multiple media outlets and repeatedly referencing lawsuits against physical therapy boards. And I just took it at face value. I just assumed that a physical therapist gave Kim Riddle Orr a collapsed lung. I could not believe what I found when I researched this, however. This pneumothorax occurred at the hands of a massage therapist in Canada uh, who completed an acupuncture program. She completed McMaster Master University's acupuncture program, which was five three-day weekends plus 174 hours of self-directed home study. Uh, <laughs> that's just crazy. And then they, they say therapist, and everybody just assumes it's a physical therapist. But this was a massage therapist that was doing acupuncture that punctured her lung. Y'all know I talked about that scar. It was a huge scar, just like a crazy big scar that went, went all the way across to, uh, from the top part of her back down to the bottom part of her back. That's not a typical scar that you would get when you have a pneumothorax. If you need a chest tube from a pneumothorax, you would have a one to two inch incision between your, your third and fourth ribs and your mid axillary line on the side of the pneumothorax, and that's about all you need. Or they may just stick a needle in your chest for a needle decompression. Uh, but Kimber Lore had a chest tube, and then she ended up getting a, an infection, uh, and she got an infection that just would not resolve. So they had to do a pneumonectomy. They had to like literally remove her entire lung. So that absolutely changed her life. She's no longer a judo Olympian. And she's walking around with one lung. Fortunately, you can—I mean—you can live with one lung, but you're probably not a high-level athlete anymore with one lung. So it absolutely changed and potentially ruined her life after this incident by an acupuncture. This uh, Tornado Wallace collapsed lung, this is most likely an, an unfortunate outcome at the hands of a physical therapist. However, the pneumothorax could have been spontaneous and not caused by needling, but I doubt it. Uh, we'll talk about spontaneous pneumothoraxes later in the course. Uh, they're certainly possible. I mean, he's, he's had lots of ski and wrecks, I'm sure. It's, it's possible he had spontaneous pneumo, but, you know, uh, I doubt it. This was probably a physical therapist that punctured his lung uh, and caused the pneumothorax. This broken needle, MMA fighter Mitch Clark's broken needle, I watched his interview online and uh, watched everything that he said. He, he said he had IMS performed by a doctor. So, you know, IMS is intramuscular stimulation. And we're not sure if it was a DPT, if it was a, a DO, an MD, a chiropractor. We're just not sure. The needle broke with the handle. It was lost in the forearm. The needle required some surgical removal. This is frequently referenced by acupuncture as proof of the dangers of unqualified people performing dry needling. But this was most likely a needle defect. Again, most likely. I didn't see it happen. However, a terrible and an aggressive technique could increase the risk of needle break. Needles... Needles don't break easily, but all needles can break. I mean, we're talking about thin metal. If you do really stupid things with that needle, it, it can break. So if you have a terrible and, a, and an aggressive technique and basically you're just an idiot, uh, then your increase of needle, your risk of needle break is potentially going to increase. Uh, used to, a long time ago, acupuncturists would reuse needles. They would re-sterilize them and they would re-sharpen them. And obviously, the more you run run a needle through a sterilizer, the more uh, you sharpen a needle, the metal is going to get thinner. So they were more likely to break. But if you're using a high quality, you know, disposable needle like we use now, your uh, likelihood of uh, a needle breaking, whether that's an acupuncture needle or an actual dry needle needle breaking, is just incredibly low, especially if you're using a, an appropriate technique. Oh, uh, we get to this. This just drives me crazy. Uh, the American Medical Association statement regarding dry needling. Let me read that to you again. Uh, so, resolved that our American Medical Association recognized dry needling as an invasive procedure and maintained that dry needling should only be performed by practitioners with standard training and familiarity with routine use of needles in their practice, such as licensed medical physicians and licensed acupuncturists, end quote, from the American Medical Association. That's just annoying. So, you know, let me try to break it apart a little bit. So they're saying such as, so that's, those are examples given. It's not exclusive. Uh, that doesn't help much there. <laughs> Physical therapists, we agree with standard training and routine use, 100%. Uh, standard training and familiarity, familiarity with routine use of needles in their practice. We completely agree with that. Here's my thing. Do licensed medical physicians have routine use of needles in their practice? Well, let's think about that for a second. Orthopedic surgeons, they have routine use of hypodermic needles to do joint injections. Uh, physical, physical medicine rehab doc has routine use of uh, hypodermic needles to do trigger point injections, to do Botox injections. Neurologist has, has routine use of needles to do uh, Botox injections. Anesthesiologist has routine use of needles to do uh, injections into the spinal canal, you know, epidural nerve blocks, all that, all that stuff. But they're not talking about that here. 
they're talking about dry needling, which is an acupuncture needle or a dry needle needle. The only people that have routine use of that type of needle are Western medical acupuncture trained physicians. However, the American Medical Association doesn't even quantify that. And they're specifically speaking about dry needling in the statement. And guess where physicians learn dry needling? They learn at a weekend course just like this. They could be right next to you in this course. But since they're physicians, 54 hours of dry needling training is okay with the AMA. If the AMA was so worried about the safety of people doing dry needling, they would have quantified that physicians, Western medical acupuncture should be the ones because they have routine use of needles in their practice. But they didn't do that. What they did, the bus was driving by and they just threw the physical therapist under the bus and then the physicians were just riding the bus, uh, which is typical in a, in a lot of uh, areas of medicine. I, you know, I don't want to talk about talk bad about physicians, but I can just kind of see straight through this. The American Medical Association was like, mm, we don't really want physical therapists doing it, but it's okay if physicians do it. And they learned it, of course, with them because they're physicians, so it's okay. Uh, so they protected the acupuncturists and then they protected the physicians and just threw us under the bus. Kind of annoying. Uh, I hope you can see through that, kind of, kind of like I can see through that. You know, physical therapists performing dry needling are absolutely not above adverse events. Adverse events happen in all forms of medicine and even in our traditional physical therapy practice. One of the, one of the recent adverse events I read about that stands out in my mind is a therapist had a patient on a Swiss ball, sitting on the Swiss ball doing some exercise. A Swiss ball popped, patient, you know, fell down to the ground, landed on their buttocks, had a lumbar compression fracture. That's not a surprise. The patient loved the therapist. The patient did not want to sue the therapist, but the patient got to get paid, right? So the patient was going to sue the Swiss ball manufacturer. Okay, I'm sure the therapist was like, whew, thank goodness I'm not going to get sued. Well, guess what? The Swiss ball manufacturer was in China. You can't sue a company in China. I mean, I guess you can sue them, but you're never going to get any money from them. So after the patient found that out, again, patient got to get paid, so the therapist ended up getting sued. Ultimately, that case, this was in a HPSO, a health providers service organization, which is carries our malpractice insurance. It was in one of their newsletters. But uh, HPSO settled for like over 400 grand uh, because the HPSO said that the therapist should have inspected the Swiss ball before placing the patient on it. You know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you've, you're always going to have some liability. But here's a few examples at the hands of a physical therapist. Uh, include that was doing dry needling. So in Colorado, 2015, you had a 36 year old with a pneumothorax after dry needling, uh, another pneumothorax in Colorado and Georgia, another pneumothorax in Maryland, Maryland, you had a penetrating nerve injury after dry needling by a PT, North Carolina, uh, you had another pneumothorax and, and North Carolina. Again, you had a penetrating cervical spinal cord injury after dry needling, uh, in Ohio, you had another pneumothorax. In Ohio, uh, you had a penetrating thoracic spinal cord injury with a spinal epidural hematoma. That is a freaking disaster. It's going to require an emergency surgery. And this is not an inclusive list. These are just a few examples because I'm, I'm about to try to prove a point here. But you know what? Could you get the plank out of your eye before you try to get the sawdust out of mine? That's a Bible verse if you're not familiar with that, but regardless of it being a Bible verse, I really like the meme of the doc sitting there with a humongous plank in his eye. He's got a pair of tweezers and he's trying to get a speck of sawdust out of the patient's eye. Because uh, that's a little bit of what we're seeing when we're dealing with the acupuncturist. Let's look at this acupuncture related adverse events a systematic review of the Chinese literature in the Bulletin of the World Health Organization. This isn't some bobo little journal. This is straight from the World Health Organization. They did a Chinese database literature review. They found 115 articles with 479 cases of serious adverse events, 14 deaths, 35 patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage, three of which died, 201 patients with pneumothorax, four of which died, uh, four patients with cardiovascular injury and ventricular puncture that resulted in two deaths, uh, don't let that fly over your head. That is a needle in the heart is what that is from an acupuncturist. 16 patients with an abdominal organ injury. Uh, there was a case of a two-year-old boy with an intestinal wall hematoma with an obstruction that required a surgical revision after he was treated for diarrhea by an acupuncturist. Three patients with an orbital hemorrhage, one with a traumatic cataract. Yeah, that's a needle in your freaking eyeball is what that is. Uh, four broken needle cases, four cases of peripheral nerve injury with, with motor deficit, and as if... That's not enough. These authors from the World Health Organization, they state, we suspect that underreporting of such events in the Chinese language literature is much higher than in the English language literature. Come on, acupuncturists. Get the freaking plank out of your eye before you try to get the speck of sawdust out of my profession's eye. 
According to the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy, dry needling has been practiced by physical therapists since the 1980s. The, Federation, the Federation's disciplinary database has no entries in any jurisdiction for a physical therapist disciplined for harm caused by dry needling. The literature reports very little serious harm or injury from dry needling performed by PTs. The most common reported side effects are soreness and minor hematomas. Now, I'm not saying with the statement that physical therapists haven't messed up and adverse events have not happened at the hands of a physical therapist. However, there has yet to be a physical therapist disciplined for harm uh, by dry needling. If you show up to work drunk and you leave a hot pack on a patient for like an hour and you, you give them like a third degree burn, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to lose your license for a while or you may lose it permanently. And then guess what? You will forever be on the Federation's disciplinary database uh, for getting in trouble. So uh, that's database is there to assist other states in, in making sure that they don't have a, a rogue provider running around. However, there has not been an entry to date, uh, to the date of this recording, from a physical therapist that has been disciplined for harm for doing dry needling. Again, the most common reported side effects are soreness and minor hematomas.